do we define the word unity? After all, we hear it all the time. Unity in jobs, unity in our schools, and unity in our church. But what is the implication behind the word? Is it nothing more than a group of people working, learning, or worshiping together, loosely linked by a common goal or belief? Perhaps unity begins as nothing more than an empty cup, a framework created to house something bigger than itself, a vehicle built to contain a combination of ingredients, each with their own special qualities that make them unique, each consisting of elements and properties that make it perfectly suited to fulfill its purpose. Together, each piece makes its own valuable contribution, regardless of its use as a singular item. Individually, each element is by no means worthless, but when combined together by the hands of a skilled creator, they become something wonderful, a delicious blend of unity. Tim drinks his black. Nothing in it. I, I don't like coffee enough to drink it that way. I need enough stuff in there to kill the, the taste of the coffee. But anyway, uh, all of us have a part, and each of us bring a different flavor and a different talent to the group, to the body, to the church, and that's what it's all about. If you uh, have your bulletins, uh, take out the insert. We've got some fillers, hopefully some things that you will find helpful this morning. Well, I didn't add it on the prayer list because it's not really spiritual. My mother turned 90 uh, years old this week, and she is a rabid Bills fan. Oh. So I am going to get an earful <laughs> this week, no matter what happens. Sorry about that. <laughs> So keep your pastor in prayer. <laughs> All right. Assembly required. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. It's there in your bulletin. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. That is an interesting way of putting it. We are to encourage one another. We are to stir one another up, kind of like a coach will stir up his players before he sends them out on the field. Stir up one another to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting, that's encouraging, one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer. Now, Lord, we pray that you take this scripture. We pray that you would help us to apply it to our hearts and to our lives, that we can be in a, a more effective witness for you, but we can be better parents, we can be better neighbors, we can be better employees, we can be better people in the community for your honor and glory. And in your name we ask these things. Amen. 9-11, I'm sure that all of us can remember where we were 15 years ago, about this time of day. Uh, looking at the, the pictures on the screen and thinking, this can't be real. This absolutely can't be real. 3,000 of our fellow citizens died because they were either going to work or they were going on a vacation. 6,000 were injured, many of them hungry. In your bulletin, you see that we ask for prayer for our first responders, firefighters, police officers. And what I always find striking when they replay those pictures is you have people running in terror for their lives. And then you have a very small group of people who are running toward the disaster. 
Our first responders were running toward the disaster, not in thought of their safety, because most of them were in a safe place, and then they went to the epicenter. But their thought and motivation was to help somebody else out. And many of them died because of many of them were injured. And we just, we owe them a special debt of gratitude, not only for what those did on that day, but for these responders that put on the badge and put on the uniform every single day and go out there and face things that you and I do not want to face. This morning's message, I'm hoping that you will find helpful. Next Sunday is back at church Sunday. We're hoping you invite somebody, and we're going to give you a little bit more information about that. Last week, we discussed some reasons why people do not go to church. If you missed it or need a refresher, uh, the church has on YouTube. Just put in Elkridge Baptist, and uh, our page will pop up. And you can see uh, the sermons and that type of thing there to catch up. Liars. Mm. Oh, yeah, there we go. In this day and age, we hear a lot about statistics. And in, let me go back one here. Oh, I guess I didn't put that one in. Okay. The stat was, or the, the quote was, statistics never lie. And liars always use statistics. You can manipulate numbers to make them say whatever you want. And, and this time, I'm not going to get into the political thing, but some, somebody takes a poll, that, and they make it say what they want it to say. Somebody else takes the exact same set of facts, and they twist it to make it say what they want it to say. And it's very, very difficult to know what's going on. And so when I give you these statistics, it's to give you a framework to, to, uh, to think, to represent on how our efforts might be best spent. If you're not honest with statistics, you can make the outcome come, come out however you want it. I keep pointing back there, but it's back there. <coughs> the Hartford Institute tells us that the attendance at a typical congregation decreased from 130 to 75 in the last 12 years. Now, keep in mind that the average congregation in the United States is 250 people or less. That's the majority. Yes, there are mega churches. They are a very small percentage of the number out there. Most churches in the United States of America uh, are this size, um, building-wise, and maybe a little bit more attendance-wise, but our church is, is average. If you take that number, uh, six million people over a decade have walked away from the church. Now, we talked about it a little bit last week with the cultural Christians, those who are Christians because the dollar in your pocket says, in God we trust. Oh, this must be a Christian nation because my money says, in God we trust. So, yeah, I'm a Christian. But in the years... Since it's becoming less and less popular to be a Christian, many people have, uh, the cultural Christians, have stopped pretending. And now they say they're none. I don't have any affiliation. In another study, Goodmanson found that churches lose an estimated 2.7 million people each year, causing 3,500 3, to 4,000 churches to close their doors every year. And this is nothing new. In some rural areas, it's not unusual for two or more congregations to share a pastor. When I used to work with churches in the Catskill Mountains of New York, uh, I know of a couple of uh, situations where a pastor would serve as four churches, and the pastor would speak in a different church every week. And so not only was it a traveling pastor, it was a traveling church. A lot different because each each congregation was not large enough to support a pastor on their own. In a Hartford study, half of all churches did not last year did not add one new member through conversion. 
The reasons given in the survey of a thousand when asked, why don't you attend church? And we talked about this a little bit last night. Some of those reasons included work, other commitments, bad experience with church people, bad experience with the pastor. Ah, attendance is not really necessary. I can worship God wherever I want. Beliefs in the church are being bored and unfulfilled. But in spite of those reasons, 82% of the people that didn't go to church said, you know, if someone invited me, I would consider it. And when they asked this, the people, the thousand people in this survey, how many have you invited? How many of you have invited someone last to church in the last year? 2%. Two out of a thousand had asked someone to church. So if we've got 178 million people not attending church in this nation, that means there are 129 million who do attend church, but only 2.5 million have tried to reach those 178 million, while 126.5 million do nothing. Could it be? reason we have so many empty spots is we are not inviting enough people. That's what the challenge is next week. Just commit to invite one or two people. Technically, statistically, if you invite four people, somebody will come. And I encourage you to do that. In high school, I took two years of drafting and then two years of mechanical design and construction. And that was something that I just kind of enjoyed a little bit, thought I was going to go that way. Um, and I, I just have a sample here for those that can't get your arms around it. What they would do, I have a, I have a sample. Take it out of here. The teacher sometimes would give us something like this. You say, what is that? I have no idea what it is. Doesn't matter. But he says, I want you to make a drawing that I could give it to a machinist like Mike back here that he could make that. And then sometimes he would give us a rough cast that had not been machined properly. And he said, I want you to design a jig that someone in a production line can take that, whatever it is and put it in the manufacturing project, uh, process. Now, let it, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this was old school pencil and paper. This was before the internet. Our vellum was two feet by three feet. It was paper and pencil. And for anyone who's noticed, if you see that I've written anything down, it's all caps. That's from four years of drafting and mechanical design and construction. I, that's just the way I learned to write. I'm comfortable with that. But I've learned that figures can be manipulated. Let me give you an example. I was talking with Mike this morning. Here it is. Has anyone ever heard of the impossible trident? It's also called a blivet, and it's also called the devil's fork. Anyone? Does that ring any bells with anyone? Got one. Wow. All right. Now, if you take a glance at that, it's not a big deal. But you look at the bottom, it's got three points. And when it goes up to the top, it, 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 you can't do it. You can do it on paper, and it looks okay. But to give that to a person who is a craftsman, that is impossible. To make. Now, this was first brought to my attention uh, by that Journal of Intellectual Knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> and they had their own name for it. They called it a point. And a point, if you look at your keyboard and start at the top right and drag your fingers six, six letters to the uh, left, that's what, a, that's what a point is. I learned that facts and figures can be manipulated, and just because it looks good on paper does not make it necessarily practical or doable. Now, I have here a drawing that if it had figures in it and a little bit more information, 
logically, at first glance, I should be able to hand it to a machinist and they would be able to make one. But upon closer inspection, it doesn't make any sense. What's the point? Programs and plans that look good on paper don't always translate into reality. So we have to be practical about things. But if I can give you statistics that you don't you hadn't thought about before or hadn't been exposed to that knowledge, I find it hard to believe that 98% of church people have never invited anybody else it's in the last year. That just boggles my mind. But if I can move you from the 98% that have never done it or even considered it to the 2% that might give, give it a shot if you had an opportunity, if the situation were correct then we'll have gotten somewhere today. And that's why I encourage you, take one, two, three, four of those cards. Four is the optimal. Take four of those cards. And just when you're talking with someone in conversation, uh, if they say something that you can twist over to a spiritual lesson, I'm not saying preach to them. But I just say, why don't you come join me at church? Do you go to church anymore? Come join me at church. Today I want to help you discover why the unchurched people remain or leave. I will hopefully dispel some misconceptions, refocus our efforts, and show perhaps some of the shortcomings that we have. Now, in the numbers that follow, you're going to see that the, the numbers don't add up neatly to 100%. This was a... Uh, in-depth study and what they've done is they've done an analysis of the most important reasons but if you divide it five ways you'll see what it was the most important what was the least important okay i'm going to throw some numbers at you and we're going to concentrate on the top five reasons that people stay or go many churches have some concern that their physical location is not optimal but in the survey, only 7% of the people said that was a factor. In the, in, the, in the Catskill Mountains, again, when I used to work with churches, when these churches were built in the 16, 17, 18, early 1900s, they didn't have the automobile. So it was a church that they could walk to. When I worked with the, uh, the Jews in the Catskill Mountains, they have, they have a, the Orthodox will not drive on Sunday. They have to be within a Sabbath day journey, which is a half a mile. So that means church cannot be worth, uh, cannot be further away than a quarter mile. Because a quarter mile there, a quarter mile back, you walked your half a mile, and you can't walk anymore on a Sunday, on the Sabbath. If you, if you got in your car on a Saturday, excuse me, a Friday afternoon, and, and started heading up, uh, on the New York State Thruway and then jumped off of Route 17 heading into the Catskills, once sundown hit, you would see people, you would see cars on the side of the road. Those were our Orthodox Jews that for some reason didn't get out of town in time. And they will either walk to their destination if it's less than a half a mile, or they will stay there for 24 hours until the Sabbath is over. Some people are very dedicated. Now, in our day and age, you know, driving 20 minutes, a half an hour, to, we, we don't think anything of it. Many churches concerned about their physical location. Again, statistically, it doesn't really matter. It's a very small percentage of people that it matters. All of us have heard about the great little diner off the beaten path that nobody else knows where it is because it's so hard to get to. When I used to travel, uh, the Northeast for business, when I would come into a new area, I would ask the, the person that I was talking to, where, where do all the truck drivers eat? Where's the best little diner that's off the <coughs> path? And found some very interesting places. We've had many opinions, comments, and concerns about the worship style of music that we use. But only 11% were attracted by a specific worship style and music. 
interestingly, I talked to two individuals this week in this conversation. This happened to come up. I didn't bring it up. They brought it up. But the one gentleman, uh, Protestant boy, married a Catholic girl, he loves the liturgy and the music of the, of the Catholic Church because he's classically trained and his church is more uh, heavy contemporary. He said, I can't stand the music at my church. I go to my wife's church for the music, but I don't like to minister there. And so we go to two churches every Sunday. Go to her church for the music, go to my church for the preaching. You gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> Talk to another fella. He loves the church that he goes to. This is a local church. Loves the church he goes to, but he can't stand the music. Again, it's very loud contemporary. And I don't have anything against contemporary. Please, I'm not trying to form your opinion here. I'm just saying that uh, two people this week have made this comment to me, unprovoked for me. And he said, yeah, I know what time I know what time the, uh, the praise band goes down, and I come to hear the, the message. <coughs> Personal choice. It's not the only factor, but it is a factor. Sometimes a silent, vocal, or sometimes a, 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 mo a vocal minority has an impact on the silent majority. Sometimes a few noisy people get things changed for just a very small percentage. All right, moving on. 12% were attracted by the ministries that were offered, such as Men's ministry, women's ministry, home groups, that type of thing. We have a lot of ministries here. It's all in a bulletin. 25% of people with children were looking for a good youth or children's ministry because they knew it was important in their upbringing, the church and the friends they made at church and the things they learned at church, and they wanted that for their kids too. My parents never went to church until I was born, and once I started uh, understanding what was going on, now I wasn't a teenager too. Uh, once I started understanding a little bit more about life, they said, we should have Ken in church. And so they started taking me to church. They got saved and baptized as a result of taking me to church because it was good for me. These things happen. 25% began attending due to a Sunday school class. 20, uh, let me see, 25% attended due to a neighbor or friend. Twice as much as the music. Offer people a ride to church. They might even say that. 38% came, came due to a family member attending. So let's focus on the top five. Number five, or the smallest percentage, 39% sensed God's presence. If you've never sensed God's presence in a room, I cannot explain it to you. But let me tell you something. When you experience it, there is no denying it. Robert pointed out at, at the little church we went to on Wednesday for, for, Paul, uh, for Paul's memorial service. You could feel the presence of God. And not all those people were believers either. But you could feel the presence of God. People are looking for something that's real. You ever notice that the lemon juice we use is artificial and the, the dishwash soap we use has real lemon in it? <laughs> People are looking for something that's real. They've heard about God. They've heard all the rhetoric. They've heard the crazies. And they say, ah, I stay away. I, you know, I don't want to be crazy like that. But then every once in a while you meet, you'll have a genuine experience where you can feel God's presence. And I think most of us, kind of like the first time we fell in love, we thought, you know what? I like that. I want a little bit more of that. All right. Next one. 41% had someone <coughs> at church witness to them. They shared the gospel. They shared their thoughts. They shared what motivated them to do good things. They shared the gospel with them. And my time is going quickly here. 39 per, excuse me, 
enjoy the friendliness of members. You know, I heard the story about the, the guy who was disheveled and, and, and didn't look very nice and, and came to come into church and the usher said, ah, no, sir, I don't think you're going to be comfortable here. You, you, you need to go outside. He was out sitting on the curb and, and really down in the dumps and, and, and Jesus walked up to him. And she said, what's the problem? He said, that they wouldn't let me in there. I wasn't welcome. He said, don't worry about that. I've been trying to get in that church for years. <laughs> Revelation chapter 3.20, when it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You look at that closely. That is Jesus standing outside of the door of the church, knocking, trying to get into the church. Revelation 3.20. Now, we use that to say Jesus knocks on our heart's door. And he wants to be in our heart. And that's true, but that's a secondary application. You look at the text and you look at the context. Jesus is trying to get into the church. Revelation 3.20, check it out. 49% enjoyed the friendliness of members. And if you look at those three scriptures, it says it three times. They're in your notes. If you look those up later, it says... Greet the brethren and the sister, by implication. Greet the brethren with a with a holy kiss. Now, the teens in college career age like that first the best. <laughs> keep, that, keep that in proper perspective. But spiritually, we're to be friendly to one another. We're to be happy to see each other. The next one. 88% embraced the doctrine. Now, the first we talked about, you have an impact on. The next two, the two most important ones, you don't have an impact on. And you'll see what I'm talking about here. St. Augustine said, in the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, grace. In all things, charity or love. For example, a Baptist distinctive, a couple of Baptist distinctives. But one of the Baptist distinctives is... We dedicate babies or children. We don't baptize babies or children. Another Baptist distinctive is we baptize believers after salvation by immersion under the water. Baptizo, the original language. Hold them under till they bubble. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Those are Baptist distinctives. Well, why do we do it that way? Because we can see examples of it in the scripture. They that gladly received the word were baptized and added to the church. We will not compromise the essentials, but give way to personal preferences. The, the Bible in the back of the pew is the NIV. And some of you read it the KJV. And others like the message. And others like the different versions. You have a preference. I can tell you one thing right now. A King James only church would, would rather have you leave, leave your Bible at home, maybe even stay at home, than to bring a non-King James version. I, I don't agree with that. Guys, some of these guys, some of you guys out there, you like Fords. Some of you like Mopar. And I will take all opportunities to teach you about it when it breaks down. My first vehicle is a GM, so I have a preference. But I drive rice rockets. Preference, not an essential. See, the essential is transportation. I want to get from point A to point B with as little hassle as possible. So whether I drive a Ford, and I've driven them all, whether I'm driving a Ford or a Chevy or a Mopar, Rice rocket. I want to get from point A to point B, and I want, I want, I've had those cars, and you probably had too, where it kept you on praying ground. Oh Jesus, please let it start. <laughs> can't be late. Anyone ever have a car like that? Oh Jesus, please let this car start. Okay. Moving on. Here's how Paul handled the, the, the dilemma in his day. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so that I could bring Christ to those who are under the law. 
Wesley's talking about is, is a kosher lifestyle and living by the orthodox ways of life. When I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. So when he's with his Jewish friends, he doesn't insist on eating, you know, having that, that bacon cheeseburger. But when, they, when he's with his Gentile friends, he doesn't scold them for eating something that's not kosher. It's not <coughs> essential of the doctrine. It's a preference. Judy and I have date night on uh, Friday nights, and, and we went out as we usually do. And there was, found out, there was a mistake on the ticket. I made the mistake, the calculation, and I called the manager the following morning, and I said, there was a mistake on the ticket. I made it, and I was wondering if you could make sure that it's corrected. And he said, well, give me the information, and I'll get back with you. He said, and I, after I told him what I had done, I had misfigured it. He says, I hope my employee did the right thing. Let's see. <laughs> and he called me back within half an hour, and he said, thankfully, my employee did the right thing. And I said, well, that's great. You don't have to fire him. He says, no, I don't. <laughs> we want other people to live to a high standard and be honest and be truthful. We should live that way, too. All right, the number one reason, number one reason, 90% is the fill-in. Based on their decision on the pastor's style of preaching, that is firmly on my shoulders, you have nothing to do with that. I am the biggest influence, whether they like the way I present, and some people don't, I, I understand that. I preach from my heart. I preach what I feel the Lord has led me to that will help somebody. And many times, many times, I've heard some, I had someone say to me, Pastor, something you said was exactly what I needed. I've had that happen many, many times. And I didn't even know, in fact, a couple of times I'd say, what did I say? <laughs> I didn't know, but the Lord put it on my lips from their heart. Now, I'm not a scholar. I like what Dave, in fact, when, when uh, I first came here, I, understanding that you had a you had pastors with doctorates, and I told Jared, I'm, I'm not a doctor guy, I'm not a current doctor guy, don't have one, don't plan to get one, if that's what you're looking for, I'm not your guy. I, I, I like what Dave Ramsey said. He said he's got a PhD in D-U-M-B. Yeah, school of hard knock, baby. <laughs> Extra classes there. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> every week, I try and offer truth, encouragement, insight to the scripture, and hope that will help you be better in your life. But what if the Lord gives me a message? He gives it to me. I comprehend it, and then I deliver it in obedience, and you didn't come that week. Who misses out? Me. I got the blessing. The person who was here, they got the blessing. I remember uh, the late Tom Maher on WCBM had a caller one day. I told Jerry about this a few weeks ago. And this caller was railing against the president, just railing. And Tom Marr just quietly said, have you prayed for him lately? I had to look down. Is this political talk radio or is this the Christian radio station? When you're, we're so quick to criticize someone, but how quick are we to pray for someone? Pray that the Lord will work in their life. Our prayer list Put those prayers out there. Now, I understand about the prayer list. 
and I pay more attention to it. It's my wife, or my son, or my daughter-in-law, or somebody I know that's on that prayer list. But if we are all family here, not blood, but spiritual, we are all family here, then whether it's my father, or my mother, or your mother, we should pray just as intent. All right, quickly here, my time is gone. We'll fly through this. Once people decide that they want to become part of a local church, only 38% base their decision on the pastor's style of preaching. It goes from 90% to 38%. A reflection of grace for, third, for sure. Thank you, Jesus. 49% remain due to fellowship with other believers and friendliness. Same as folks that are looking at the church for the first time. 54% knew that God had called them to this place of worship. Judy and I, we would move around to different places in, in uh, uh, the country with job opportunities. First thing we did was we found a school for our boys because the homeschooling wasn't uh, there. And I was also informed that was a quick way to divorce court to think that she was going <laughs> to homeschool four boys. Um, and so we would look for a school, and then we'd look, we'd, in New York State, you draw 50, the, the uh, public school transports within 15 miles, so we'd find a school, and then we'd look for a house within 15 miles, and once we found a house, we started looking for a church. And we'd look, go to a church, and eh, go to a church, eh, and go to a church, boom, that's it. And as soon as that, the Lord had put that on our heart, and we knew it was right, we were down the front, and we were shaking, you know, I've said it before, the right hand of Christian fellowship, tithing envelopes in the left hand, and, and we were involved. And we're singing in the choir, and, and going to the Sunday school, and, and we made, because we, our family is 300 miles away. In our case, that was a good thing. Our family was 300 miles away. Our church family became our local family. But we did that with intent. We did it on purpose, and we made it work. We never found an unfriendly church when we said, hey, can I sing in the choir? Hey, can I help in the kitchen? Hey, can I work in the Sunday school? I never found an unfriendly church. I always found people that are willing to open their arms and say, man, come on in and be a part of us here. 54% knew that God had called them to the place of worship. 55% uh, percent enjoy being a part of some Bible study, whether it be Sunday school or a men's Bible study or some kind of a small group. And 60% like the opportunity to minister to others. You see, personal ministry is the key to personal fulfillment and church growth. We are all made to be needed. We are all made, excuse me, to help other people, to reach out. Assembly is required. Getting together, sharing our joys, sharing our burdens, sharing our hearts. I'm going to ask Stephanie to come. You need to do business with God today. This is the time that we have set aside to do it. Let's all stand while we work for our Lord. We're thankful for the time that you've given us this morning. We're thankful for the scripture that you've given us this morning. We pray that we will apply it to our hearts. In your name we ask these things.